Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Advances and Challenges in Laboratory Rodent Management in Chile. Our situation with emphasis in Zavaria conditions, surgery, anesthesia, and euthanasia. I am Christina Mahalik of Labyrinth, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labyrinth, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Labyrinth. To learn more, visit labyrinth.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems, seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report the problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. It is now my pleasure to present today's speaker, <laughs> Jessica Gipple, DVM, MSC, PhD, Animal Welfare Officer, Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. Dr. Gipple graduated as a vet from the Universidad de Chile, and after a couple of years working with South American camelids in north of Chile, went to the UK where she did a, an MSc in Biointegrative Science and then graduated as a PhD at the University of Oxford. Her research there was about the effects of housing in the husbandry on welfare of laboratory primates using behavioral and non-invasive indicators of welfare. On her return to Chile, she worked at the National Zoo implementing environmental enrichment and teaching animal behavior and welfare at the Catholic University PUC. Dr. Gimple now works full-time at the medicine, uh, at the medicine fa faculty PUC where she is responsible for the welfare of animals used in research. She is in charge of the animal facility as well as supervising compliance within the, the institution's animal care program. She also teaches and trains students and PIs about animal use and research, both from an ethical and a practical point of view. She is a member of the Institutional Scientific Ethics Committee for the Care and Use of Animals in Research of the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. In that role, she collaborates in the development of regulations to carry out the ethical evaluation and implementation of project post-approval monitoring. She is an active member of the Chilean Society of Laboratory Animal Sciences, whose main objective is to improve standards of care and use of animals in research, Take, taking animal welfare as central to their work. She is also an ad hoc member of ALAC. Dr. Gimple will now begin her presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation. It is a special thanks because for years now, they have been following our process in Chile. This is the third time we participate telling you, the audience, about how we have been implementing animal care programs in order to improve animal welfare of laboratory animals and the quality of research, both at our institution, the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile, and also spreading our knowledge and experience to the rest of our colleagues in the country. So, uh, the aims of this talk are to provide an overview of the main challenges and advances of animal research in a developing country like ours, 
uh, with evolving regulations. And in that way, to increase um, awareness of the need we all have of, of standards harmonization in laboratory animal research between developed and developing countries, given the increasing importance of globalization and international collaboration. We all want our work to be worth, to be of high quality, while at the same time we would like to respect and avoid unnecessary um, suffering of our subjects of study, the laboratory animals. So first of all, let me give you some context of the way things are in Chile. We are a distant and small country, but we do perform important research and have established interesting international collaboration links with researchers in North America, Europe, and other regions of the world. In terms of the use of animals for research, we don't have official statistics, actually we don't have any, about how many animals are used for research in Chile, nor do we know the proportion of animals used in, for each um, type of research. Um, as I was saying, we don't have any statistic about, about those numbers, uh, as there is no authority designated to collect that information. So this slide here is just for you to get an overview of what we do. Basic and biomedical research probably use most of the animals that go into research. There are several universities with strong teams of investigators in basic and applied sciences. Just to mention one, neuroscience is a strong and productive field uh, of research in our country. There are also many scientists conducting research about important human illnesses, such as degenerative and chronic diseases, as well as infectious ones. In addition, Chile has very strict regulations for protecting farm animals' health. For example, in poultry industry, some situations such, such as uh, potential disease outbreaks imply the use of very high numbers of animals in order to perform very rapid diagnostic tests. Therefore, our Farm Animal Health Service, SAG, breeds large stocks of potentially necessary animals for those diagnostic purposes. Also, for toxicology diagnosis, we have more than 4,000 kilometers of coastline that is continuously monitored for the appearance of red tide, a toxin carried by uh, shellfish that is potentially lethal for human consumption. So all extracted stock of shellfish must be tested continuously. This means the breeding and use of high numbers of mice for those purposes. <coughs> Some of our advances. Uh, with all those animals being used for research, fortunately, we have had important advances in the last decade. The first research ethics committees were formed to comply with international requirements uh, for collaboration with foreign institutions, such as the NIH, for example, and about the same time, our National Scientific Research Funding Agency also set ethics evaluation as a requirement for all projects using animals. Our animal protection law, established in 2009, covers all types of animal use, i.e. the farm animals, pets, wild and zoo animals, and also animals used in scientific research. That section of the law defines what is covered by this regulation. Basically, everything within research and education where animals are used. Even non-interventional studies such as behavioral observation. It defines who can do it, stating that researchers must have appropriate training. And it also defines that facilities must be adequate for each species. All of this is aimed at avoiding unnecessary suffering. So all of this is, in fact, an important advance. However, the bad news for us who work in laboratory animal care is that regulations in order to implement that law are not working yet um, uh, fully in place. The law is a very general text, but the actual detailed regulations to make it work have still not been put in place. Therefore, even though uh, the law states that someone working with animals in scientific procedures must have appropriate training. It is not defined what, actually, what that actually involves. 
It, this implies that there are no officially recognized courses about experimental animal care. This also means that there is no official control of how animals are actually used. So at last, animal care, animal, uh, sorry, so at last, animal use and care depends on each institution and how seriously this issue is taken. Fortunately, more and more institutions and scientists themselves are understanding how the quality of research is affected by the conditions in which laboratory animals are kept and how procedures are carried out. I am fortunate to work at a university that, that takes research quality very seriously and is not only allocating considerable funds into improving laboratory animal housing conditions, but also setting up a central ethical review body. This means now all faculties and research centers at the Catholic University of Chile must go through a thorough evaluation with the same standards for the whole institution. And this is before any work with animals is done. So um, our IACUCs at national level, uh, or how we call them, sequales, uh, this is just the, the, the literal translation of IACUC, um, they are uh, in many institutions um, already. They have been progressively implementing their own research ethics committee, committees, and we have also formed our National Laboratory Animal Science Association, ASOCICAL, and become members of our regional uh, federation called CESACAL, and members of the International Council for Laboratory Animal Science, ICLAS. We have had two IACUC national meetings and are planning the third one for this year. As you can see in this table, we get an important number of attendants coming from different backgrounds, academia, government institutions, and private organizations. The purpose of, this, of the first uh, national meeting that we held back in 2013 was to get to know each other from, <coughs> sorry, um, to form a national network and to try to standardize criteria for ethical and animal welfare evalu evaluation of research projects using animals. Our first step then was to agree on having a national form that researchers have to fill and submit to their committee. I have to say that this is not official, so there is not an actual document as a national form as there is in other countries, but in practice, we all have the same questions in it with only small differences. So even though the law is still not working properly, through agreement and proactivity, we have managed to work in a rather unified way. In order to prepare for our first national meeting um, in 2013, we ran an online survey um, at that time. And some of you might have seen some of these graphs <coughs> sorry, in an earlier bioconference. So I'm not going to show you all of them again, but, but just a few to give you more context. I apologize that the graphs um, are so small. I'm not sure if you can actually see them properly. But I will try to go briefly over the most important facts that I want to show you. These graphs represent how the IACUC situation was before we started our national network. So we wanted to get a general picture of that. The first one shows that at, the time, at that time, most institutions had their committees in place, over 90%. Sorry, I forgot I don't have a, that my um, mouse is not a pointer. So this one, over 90%. Um, of institutions with their um, uh, IACUC in place, and also that, um, let me see if this works here, that over 60% were, um, uh, um, sorry, institutional. So they depended on central uh, authority. This one here, um, uh, shows that we found that just over 60% were able to take resolutions 
Hence, they were not completely able to carry out their mission. Another problem reflecting the lack of adequate functioning, in our opinion, was that 70% of them did not have an established frequency of meetings, but had sessions only when they needed to evaluate projects. This, of course, did not allow for the, the other functions, functions of an IACUC to be in place, such as periodically checking facilities and post-approval monitoring. So this is where we started to work together in order to harmonize what our IACUCs uh, were doing and keep working on that. Um, in line with that work, a couple of uh, months ago, no, sorry, I'm a bit confused now. There. In line of that work, a couple of months ago, I carried out a national online survey to find out about general characteristics of roading housing conditions in our country. As you may imagine, this is sensitive information and it's, it is not easy to obtain, uh, especially given that we do not have any mandate to register Vivaria nor an authority that collects these data. <clears throat> Therefore, for this kind of survey, we depend on goodwill and on the trust built through our national network and years of working already, as well as the notion that we are all working to improve our national standards regarding laboratory animal welfare. Hence, the purpose of this survey was to estimate the variability of vivaria conditions in order to have data to show authorities and government decision makers in animal research the potential effect on experimental results due to the lack of standardization in these matters in Chile. The survey was carried out using SurveyMonkey. Participants were sent an email explaining the aim of the survey and inviting them to respond anonymously. The invitation was sent out to 35 Vivaria managers uh, from academic, private, and government institutions. 30 replies were received, so we think this is a good estimation of what we have today. This isn't published published yet, and I am not going to show you all the results, but briefly go over some of the facts that appeared interesting to me. Bear in mind that all these questions refer to standards maintenance conditions of rats and mice, i.e. not during experimental um, procedures that might imply special conditions. In the first graph, we can see the type of caging that is used for rats and mice. 46% are polycarbonate static cages, 20% polysulfone static cages, and 18% of uh, our replies um, said that they used individually ventilated cages, IVCs. I honestly thought that the oldest cages that we had in the country were those made of glass fiber that we still see in some vivaria. Uh, but was surprised to see that there are still some vivaria that keep animals in metal cages, both with solid and wire mesh floor, nearly 8% of replies. The second graph shows that in the type of, shows that in the type of cage cleaning and disinfection, there is also important variability in the practices different vivaria use. For example, 16% for only washing each time the cage is changed. The majority wash and then disinfect cages using chemical disinfectants, this is 52%, and 16% autoclave the cages each time uh, they change them. Here are the data for the type of diet and water provided to rats and mice. Fortunately, in terms of diet, there has been a change in the last five years, moving from a national diet to certified imported diet. However, there are still 30% of vivaria using this very poor quality national diet. And I say this responsibly. This is a bad diet in nutritional and microbiological terms. 
regarding water, 38% of vivaria use non-treated, sorry, this is the graph, non-treated tap water, and then there is all the spectrum of filtered tap water, distilled water, autoclaved water, 19%, and acidified water, 12%. Again, a lot of variability there. Regarding staff, and this is the only question in the survey that is the same as the one we did in 2013, the staff working um, there, uh, just considering the, the existence of a vet, uh, still we find some vivaria that have no vet working with them. As it is anonymous, we don't know if these are the same three places or, um, of, or if they are others. Um, but this is another matter that legislation should, should solve. What happens are our, at our institution, the Catholic University of Chile? I am fortunate to work in a university that has realized the importance of improved and standardized conditions for research animals. And so, has embarked on a long-term project for new animal care facilities and the implementation of a proper animal care program with the aim of applying for accreditation when the whole system is working. For this, we are in the process of building a new central vivarium where all the breeding will take place and two satellites for housing and carrying out experimental protocols. They will all work with standardized operational procedures and have SPF animals. We are training our staff, which means continuously training ourselves as well. Within this program, we have recently started an initiative to run on-site courses about experimental animal care in the main regions of our country, given that we have realized that this can help speed up changes more rapidly because we can reach out to more people in each facility than when we run cor courses in Santiago and hope that people from the regions will be able to spare a week from work to attend uh, those courses here in Santiago. So this is a big challenge that we have imposed out ourselves at the Catholic University, and we do it because we believe at, that conditions and practices have to improve, and hopefully we can help with that too. We are moving from this sort of con very conventional conditions with open static polysulfone cages to this. This is the sort of new facility that uh, we are building. These pictures are from our transition facility that, is, that has only IVCs and operates with all due standardized procedures. It has been running for more than a year now while building of the new central vivarium is taking place. And it has been a good progressive learning experience and training opportunity for ourselves and our staff too. Now, to get into more specific matters such as the advance, advances and challenges we face in the practice of surgery, analgesia and anesthesia, this is uh, a process that, of course, replicates what I was telling you at the beginning of this talk, and it is underpinned by the lack of implementation of the existing law, but at the same time by the willingness of individual institutions who want to make progress in order to improve animal welfare and the quality of their research. Our IACUC asks now for very detailed information in the process of research project evaluation. The first thing is to adequately justify the procedure or to consider replacement. And I'll come back to this in the next slide. We also ask for the information related to type and dose of anesthesia and, and analgesia, description of the surgical room where the procedure will take place, the previous training of researchers that will perform surgery, what sort of intraoperative support they will give animals, as well as post-operative care and the type and frequency of, monitor, of monitoring the animals after the surgical procedure. We even ask them not to perform surgery after Wednesdays because we are aware of staff limitations that make it difficult to supervise animals through weekends. As I was saying, 
we ask for appropriate justification. And as such, there are many procedures, especially for surgical training, that now avoid the use of animal mo models by using different kinds of simulation. Here we see part of the center of simulation of our medicine school that was officially opened last year, even though part of it had already been running for some years. Training surgeons can now practice here, and some of them, like our team of plastic surgeons, have become very creative and resourceful and have designed a microsurgery course using commer commercial chicken blood vessels to practice for things as arterial anastomosis. They have demonstrated through a project funding, funded by our medical school that the learning co curve is at least as good as when working with live animals. So this is what they use now to train specialists here. We can observe one of these practices in the picture of the right. At this point, please allow me to, uh, for me to tell you a personal anecdote. Two weeks ago, I had a serious fall at work and cut my lip quite badly. I was taken to the emergency of our university hospital to have my face and lips sutured. I was really proud and happy to see a young resident plastic surgeon that I had lectured about experimental animal care and who is now part of what we colloquially here call the chicken wing project. He was the one who made my stitches and if you could now look at my face, you couldn't tell I had such a bad wound two weeks ago. A lot of, the, of his good skills were learned through replacement. He's actually the one doing that anastomosis in the picture of the right. I am really proud of that. In this picture, you can see the experimental medicine surgery room. In the Center for Medical Research, where I am based, we work not only with mice and rats, but also with swine and sometimes sheep. So these surgical rooms are big and adaptable for the range of animal size that we manage. This is the kind of equipment our researchers use nowadays. We still have a long way to make more progress, but we believe, but believe me, this is already very different to the basic equipment they used to have only some years ago. Many research teams now use inhaled anesthesia, thermal platforms with integrated temperature monitoring in order to keep the animal temperature well regulated during surgical procedures and through our persistent advice. And believe me, I can be very persistent. They have started acquiring physiological monitors to control intraoperative values. This is also greatly influenced by the work of our IACOG through post-approval monitoring, where rates of failure or mortality rates are monitored. Another advance that I am, that I am happy to share with you is our constant effort to, make, to improve training. Hands-on training surgical courses have become valuable tools to gradually change investigators' outdated and tradition-based surgical practices. These pictures are from a workshop we had in 2014 when Dr. Marcel Perret gentil came to our university for a week and ran a series of different practical modules, teaching not only about specific procedures like the ones shown on this slide, but also emphasizing the importance of aseptic techniques, aseptic technique, animal preparation, and postoperative care. Marcel has been twice in Chile now running these courses, and as far as I know, he's coming back this year. So we're very happy to have him again here. I have to say how grateful we are about his generosity with his knowledge and how inspiring he is. Yesterday, we heard Mr. Flegel about the importance of having good trainers and how it is not just about you being very good at surgery or about a particular technique, but how you are able to transmit that knowledge. Marcel Perret-Gentil is one of those persons, a very good trainer, and I thank him for that. Well, as also Marcel was telling us yesterday in his talk, some researchers keep outdated 
practices and do not pay proper attention to fundamental issues such as aseptic techniques. Experience has taught us here that a good solution to that, when no other, other argument is accepted, is to have evidence-based arguments. This is a picture of an animal that had finished experimental protocol and was euthanized to obtain tissues that did not involve the site of a previous surgery that had taken place three weeks earlier. According to the investigator, this animal was absolutely okay. As a vet, I did not agree because I had seen some signs in this rat's behavior and fur cover. So I performed a necropsy in the site of surgery. In this way, I was able to show the researcher the evidence that his surgical practice was not really adequate. I have to say that fortunately, this is an old picture and I have not found anything like this ever again. So we are confident that we are making progress. I only show it because I think it is a good tool that one can use when bad or outdated practices are not easy to, to get changed. Regarding analgesia, an advance has been the inclusion of more alternatives to use as analgesics. The tradition, again, that rule before IACOX came into place, was to use what the particular lab had always used. Sometimes that meant no analgesia, sometimes only one non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory agent. The challenge for us was to change the idea that all analgesics will affect experimental protocol and, di and data, and thus it is better not to use them. Some of this is true, but nowadays the effect and magnitude of particular drugs on specific metabolic paths are known which is better than having the effect of pain, where we face unknown levels of pain and often tremendous effects on physiology. Our advance on that is to offer alternatives of analgesics, not just the one um, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, but also opioids that affect different pathways. Still, if an investigator persists on the idea of not using any analgesia, then our IACUC asks to justify the argument with a pilot showing the evidence that the specific parameter studied in their, stu in their uh, research is indeed affected. As also shown on this slide, we place emphasis on post-surgical monitoring and train them to use specific tools such as the mouse and the rat grimace scale. We also encourage investigators to use preemptive analgesia. As I mentioned earlier, the use of inhaled anesthesia has increased the last couple of years. This is partly due to the technical advice from vets emphasizing the advantages of inhaled over injected anesthesia. This has helped to gradually change the traditional researchers' view, and they have started to realize that inhaled anesthesia equipment is an investment rather than a cost. When they see how mortality rates drop drastically when changing from injected to inhaled anesthesia and all the work, money, and animal lives saved by this more modern anesthesia application. Lastly, we have placed emphasis too on euthanasia methods, teaching investigators which methods are acceptable, acceptable with conditions, and unacceptable. We know this is not a nice subject, and therefore, in some cases, it is neglect, neglected to touch on this issue. But I believe it is so crucial that it has to be one of the main subjects of training in animal care courses. Not all animals that we breed or house will actually be in an experimental protocol, nor have surgery or even samples taking, taken during their life but all of our experimental animals will undergo, an, uh, will undergo euthanasia. Hence, it has to be a central concern, and all people working with experimental animals must have some kind of training about it, not just the ones that will actually perform that procedure. 
And this does not only refer to the methods, but also the timing of euthanasia. What happens when cages are accumulated in a different room for euthanasia of excess animals? What happens when a humane point is reached? If the animal has to wait for it because other daily routine practices are considered more important at that time, then we are in trouble. Timing is an important issue in euthanasia. So these are some of the concepts I try to co convey when I train investigators and staff. An important part of this training are workshops, not just lectures where I tell them what is appropriate, but workshops where we can discuss issues, because euthanasia is an issue in itself for many people, and because it is an evolving issue. Every year we get more evidence of this and that method being more or less appropriate. Also, hands-on practical sessions in order to learn how to do it properly and how to recognize when it is not done adequately. Apart from the training that I do at my university, last couple of years I have been running these workshops in other institutions. And you can see in this slide the numbers of attendance. The one um, in 2016 was an internal workshop for SAG. This is our National Farm Animal Health Authority. Remember, I told you at the beginning, large numbers of animals are used there for diagnostic purposes. Therefore, euthanasia is a big issue for them too. And I am glad that they now have an IACUC in place that was able to recognize that need for training the staff. Of SAG. So I hope I have achieved some of the aims of this talk by giving you an overview of our challenges and advances. All of them require a strong institutional support and the certainty that research quality improves when animal welfare is brought into the equation. It is true that we have a lack of implementation of our legislation, but we have shown that we can still do important progress while waiting for that to happen. Finally, I hope this talk, with this talk, it has also, it has become once again, as you probably know it already, the importance of the need of standards harmonization in laboratory animal research between developed and developing countries. Thanks for taking the time for listening to this talk. Thank you, Dr. Gimple, for your presentation. Um, a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Please simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presenta presentation window. And uh, Dr. Gimple will answer as many questions as time permits. So please do go ahead and submit your questions. Okay, it looks as though we don't have any questions today, but I would like to thank you, uh, thank Dr. Gipple for her time. Uh, Dr. Gipple, do you have any uh, closing statements? Um, thank you. Uh, just uh, to thank the audience, I know uh, to, to find out about the reality of other countries um, must be something that uh, is not on your daily um, desires, but uh, I think it's wonderful that over 40 people have been listening to this. So um, I am available for, uh, if anyone has um, comments afterwards, um, they can contact me. Thank you very much again for attending this. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, actually, Dr. Gimple, we, we literally just got in a question, if you don't mind answering. The question asks, uh, what are you doing to further move, uh, to move to further towards improvements in Chile? 
Well, I was, as I was saying, um, we are working uh, together, the members of IACOOKS and also the people who work at um, Bivaria, because we come together in the National Laboratory Animal Science Association. We regularly uh, hold meetings and courses to train ourselves. And as um, the law is still not working properly because all the rules um, are not in place, so to say, for example, how much training someone needs or what is a certified animal care course. Um, so in the National um, Laboratory Animal Association, what we've been doing is to draft those rules that will um, enable the law to work. Uh, what is lacking uh, is um, to have a national ethics committee uh, that was uh, set out in, in the animal protection law. Um, it even has um, the posts of the people who should be called there for that national committee, but that national committee is still not in place, and they are the ones that should be writing uh, the norms that with, uh, will make this part of the law uh, work for us. And we've been waiting for that to happen for years now, uh, so we've gone ahead and drafted all the rules that this law should contain and have them ready for when that committee is formed so that they can work with that. Well, thank you, Dr. Gimple, for answering that last-minute question. And I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today. Uh, additionally, we'd like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. This webcast can be viewed on demand through July 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed it today. This is Christina. We'll see you next, next time here at LabRoots. Goodbye. <laughs>